Hello and welcome to the sixth and final episode of this Aranax podcast mini-series, which has been focused on the evolution of industrial life cycle assessments, and with a particular look at how they will play a stronger role influencing the shipping industry. My name is Craig Eason, I'm the editor of the Fathom World News site and host of the Aranex podcast. My name is Rasmus Elsper Jensen. I'm the founder and CEO of Reflow. Um, at Reflow, we are assisting ship owners and equipment manufacturers and other stakeholders in the maritime industry to become more data driven using life cycle assessment and life cycle thinking as a way to create better and higher quality data. In the studio today, we have a very exciting uh, visit. We have the head of innovation and research at Danish Ship Finance, uh, Christopher Rex, uh, who will today um, talk a little bit about how um, he sees life cycle thinking uh, within his segment and what are the outlooks for life cycle thinking within the maritime industry. So welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Rasmus, and thank you, Craig, for inviting me. I think one of the most important parts when we look into the future is how do we um, how do we decarbonize the shipping industry? But first and foremost, before we begin to look into alternative fuels, how do we increase energy efficiency use of existing vessels? This is where we begin to look into EEXI regulation and CII regulation coming into force over the next year by the IMO. And it, it is clearly all about increasing the fleet efficiency on, on, on a moved unit basis. But at a certain point in time, we will have to consider whether it makes more sense to life extend existing vessels or whether we should begin to fleet renew existing fleets by ordering new ships. And before we can be able to give any kind of clear indication of which way should we go, we need to have a clear understanding of the CO2 impact or the CO2 equivalent impact on life extending existing existing vessels relative to the CO impact CO2 impact of building a new vessel. So for me, this is very much a question about future business models. I mean, we all know that the that tonnage providers and uh, they have very little access to capitalize on on the abatement potentials of reducing CO2 emissions simply because these guys are not paying for the fuel. We are currently discussing how they, how they uh, an attempt to uh, time charter contracts can be made to uh, take into account CAI ratings, but basically I find it very difficult to imagine that we can restrict the usage of the ships without impacting the commercial value of the ship. So to my understanding, the CII rating, the life cycle assessment is also going hand in hand with where do we see the competitive landscape uh, pointing uh, at the moment? I, and I would suggest that from my perspective, we are looking into a competitive landscape going more and more in the direction of, uh, of consolidation, uh, where each individual ship has become larger and larger and more and more digital. So digitalization is both a key concern in all our scope one, two, and three mission assessments, but also in the whole ball game of reducing CO2 emissions from operating the vessel and measuring CO2 emissions on, on this life cycle assessment basis. Yeah, th thank you, Christoph. And that's a perfect example on how to actually utilize life cycle assessment and the life cycle thinking because the LCA gives you a more holistic picture of the um, emissions in the entire life cycle of a vessel already from the design phase, construction phase to the maintenance and possible life, lifetime extension um, and all the way to the end of life. So, so yeah, it's very good you mentioned that because, of course, this is exactly where uh, LCA can give a holistic picture or more uh, whole picture, not just optimizing fuel or energy efficiency. And I think some of the things that we already have been touching base on in this series is also what we call burden shifting is the, is the uh, effect you can get if you optimize the energy performance of something, but uh, that could involve investing in new technology on board the ship that will uh, incorporate more CO2 in the construction or the retrofitting phase. So so that is uh, could be an example on how to apply life cycle thinking. But where do you see, Christoph, uh, the whole life cycle thinking um, from, from the investment perspective? You touched a little bit base on it. Do you see it as uh, perhaps even... 
a necessity in the future or uh, is it still, you know, where are we right now with the whole life cycle assessment as a tool? I think at least from a banker's perspective, it is still quite early days. Um, on the one hand, we do not have very very many standards to, to how we are actually measuring uh, the, the life cycle assessment. And we don't have a lot of data examples. So, so first and foremost, we need to establish how do we measure it and uh, and how do as many participants in, 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 in the ecosystem access these data and, 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 and how do we how do we navigate the transition towards a, a future where we are utilizing a, available resources as good as possible? I think that um, at the moment, a lot of, if you take the tanker, tanker ships as an example, we know that many oil majors have a, a quite, quite a strict regulation of, of whether they will take a older ships, that is ships that is older than, let's say, 15 years, on long-term charm charters. Um, this is basically a one size fits all, no matter how the ships have been operated and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and maintained. But if we are beginning to have significantly better data, both on, on, the, on the maintenance and actual CO2 emissions from operation, but we also begin to understand the CO2 impact of uh, life extension versus building new, it might begin uh, that we can see that on the one hand, oil majors will, will use older ships for longer, but also that the financial community and the banks are able to maintain these assets bankable for longer. So basically meaning that we can allow individual ship owners to have uh, as much value in their savings, the older vessels, as possible over time, and thereby making the transition towards fleet renewal as smooth as possible whenever it makes sense from both an economic perspective, but definitely also from a CO2 equivalent perspective. I think it's, it's super important, but also very early days. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right here, but we are actually uh, seeing uh, ship owners moving in. But back to your example on how to utilize life cycle assessment to assess lifetime extension. What do you think, uh, what do you hope to see out of a, a potential um, study like that? I think understanding, we all know that it, it, it takes a lot of resources, a lot, a lot of energy and CO2 equivalents to build a new ship. But few of us actually, or at least I don't understand the, the, actually, the actual figures to the degree of uh, how do I actually save net CO2 if I life extend five years or even 10 years in, in, in well-maintained, well-built well, uh, and well-operated uh, ships? Or, or when, how, how long can I can I life extend before my my uh, CO2 footprint tilts? Uh, these these figures I I don't have access to them. I have, in fact, I have never seen them. So I at the moment I'm just assuming that uh, that it will be more CO2 consuming to build new rather than uh, life extending. Um, and I think we also need to put in a, an additional uh, loop to the life assessment uh, topic, and that is closed loop circularity because from other industries we clearly know that one thing is to build and then so sell the scrap the scrap parts end of life to other entities that are, that are doing other other things with with, with 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 the materials in question but if we can actually reuse and remanufacture as as large parts of the of the of the ship's components into new ships then our life cycle assessment takes a next level so to speak so we it, it, it pretty much depends on whether we are whether we are just thinking one step ahead or whether we are thinking a systemic change to how we are building, owning, operating, maintaining, and uh, and reusing ships in, in the future. So at the moment, it is pretty much just um, emissions from from uh, from fuel versus emissions from building new ships we are looking into. But we can take it we can take it even further in in the future. And I think that. We, we need we need to understand it as a journey with different different steps on it, and we are clearly in the early days and the first steps. But 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 talking about the perspective, I think it's it's super important that we can we can imagine where which directions we're heading at. Uh, so so certainly it is it is it will be a topic that we'll talk much more about as as as, uh, as the years progress. Yeah, thank you for that. I think uh, just to to put a little comment on that, uh, we just um, previously made a study on an electrical ferry uh, operating within the Danish islands. And what we could see there is that 
you know, when you look at the traditional vessels today, you very much talk about fuel as the biggest uh, contributor to the total emissions of the vessel's life cycle. And that's very much true. And numbers that we have uh, have calculated is around 87, even 90 percent, depending on the operational profile and the vessel type. But when we start looking at decarbonized vessels like this electrical ferry, it's important to say that the emission profile is totally changed. Now we are seeing if you utilize uh, green electricity for the consumption, we're seeing a change in the profile from uh, from the uh, previously mentioned values to down to about seven eight percent of scope one emissions from uh, from the combustion, and that is from emergency uh, backup uh, generator. So that means that now, when you start decarbonizing vessels you will see a completely different emission profiles. You will see the scope one is no longer the most important part of the emissions. Um, and the scope three, which is the vessel itself and its life cycle, will start to be the dominant uh, emissions. Naturally, we're going to see much lower emissions than we have with the traditional fossil fuel powered uh, vessels. But it's just underlying the importance of managing both uh, sides of the emissions, the fuel, but also the vessel, because once you're starting changing this, um, you will you will see how the scope three can increase to uh, some numbers that we're calculating on the ferries all the way up to 65% is now scope three emissions. So this is uh, really important and also falls into what we see for the future on the, uh, the use of life cycle assessment on electrical um, or on decarbonized vessels. This is the Aranax podcast from Fathom World, a show about transformation and change. I think there was an element there of what you're saying that just reminded me of some of the early episodes that we had in this mini series when we were talking to the manufacturers and even the suppliers of equipment into the maritime sector. They're already beginning to look at their life cycle assessments to do their homework and to get the figures because it's something that they feel they need to do. The investors need to do it, need to have it, and they need to be able to provide that data. It's only a matter of time before they are so competent at doing it that they become part of that cog of change that we're beginning to see. And the more organisations that surround the shipping industry that are doing it, the easier surely it's going to become. I mean, I know, Rasmus, that we were talking earlier, um, in an early episode, we were talking to Anna Connor and when we were talking to Megan Rue, that they were talking about how one life cycle assessment impacts another and about, um, I can't quite remember the phrase that you were using, but there's a kind of knock-on effect when you're doing these to understand how one impacts the other. But as you build up this insight, you're going to make it a lot more familiar and comfortable for organisations to go beyond that compliance point. Okay, I, from my understanding, it, it's, you, you're completely right. Uh, I think that on, on, I, 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 I just need to, to, to link it to, to the comment Rasmus made as well, because I completely understand and appreciate the importance of Ras, Ras, what we are saying, Rasmus, on, 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 on how these uh, footprints are changing when we, when we look into next generation vessels. But, but at the moment, we are, and, and your example was also a short sea shipping example, but when we are looking beyond the short sea shipping examples and look into the larger tram segments, and this is where we are seeing the major CO2 footprint for the shipping industry. This is within the the, the the larger ship segments and the deep sea shipping segments, including also the big container vessels, of course, and the railroads and the car carriers. But in for these vessels, this is I the, the same logic applies as what you just mentioned for the short sea one. But many of these ships still have a significant uh, life in, uh, 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 ahead of them. So if we were to decide to fleet renew them today, we would not only waste a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, of spent but not yet utilized CO2 on, on scrapping the vessels, but we would also um, put in a, a significant higher amount of CO2 footprint building new vessels. Uh, but also increasing the financial risk of choosing a propulsion system or fuel system that is uh, not guaranteed to be the, f- the, the choice of the future. So I think at the moment there's a lot to talk to talk uh, um, to to uh, argue forward that we are that we are we are life extending and we are we are decreasing. 
the, the energy consumption per moved units rather than we are fleet renewing on short term and 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 the, and 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 all the good points made on on, on the long term perspective is, is completely true but the fuel side is not ready within the next five to ten years so we, we have to be careful here looking into the short term obligation for all of us is to reduce the co2 footprint in in the short to medium term rather than speculating on what we will do in the mid 30s or whatever we are looking into yeah i i agree uh, i agree with you uh, christoph on the on the time perspective definitely um but when do we then start because if it's not important right now because there is some time to go um i mean that one of the biggest challenges we have when we assist ship owners and manufacturers in assessing using these life cycle based models their vessels is that there is no data available. There is no data from the engine manufacturers on the carbon footprint of their production of the engines. There is no data from the shipyards on the carbon footprint of their processes and so on. So if can we risk if we wait too long that uh, we're going to be so far behind? Or do you think we should start already now in uh, getting the ship owners to ask for data? I, th- I think we definitely need to get the discussion rolling, and 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 when, when we talk about investors and investors' ESG profiles, I think it's super important that we look beyond the 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 fuel emissions in, within the E and include these life cycle assessments on on on, on vessels and whether we whether we fleet renew or life extend. So I think definitely think at the moment we need to we, we need to broaden our, our data perspectives. We need to understand what kind of choices choices we are we are making. And you and I, and I think also together with Craig, have in the past discussed all these all these uh, topics around circular maintenance, for example. And this is this is also smaller components in in in, in this larger game. But but I'm just saying that. Or even though we have, we need to measure, we need to understand the choices we are doing, and in some cases it, it might make, make perfectly sense, in particular for all the liner trading ship segments, to 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 do the shift sooner than later. But for many of the tramp runs, uh, we need to have a distribution channel on the on the fuel supply ready, or a dual fuel um, uh, fuel choice in in place, so we can so we can so we can both conquer next generation fuels and traditional fuels uh, depending on what is available in in various locations so i'm definitely not talking against the life cycle assessments and, and and importance here i'm just saying that from a commercial perspective we we we, we need we need we need to walk through a different stages before we can make a full full scale switch towards uh, a zero carbon uh, fuel supply and and that might take a little bit longer for some segments rather than others but we definitely need to have the to have the, the the data pictures and the and the, and the commitments to reduce all all emission scopes and the, and and on a, on a CO2 equivalent basis uh, ready before necessarily we 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 are fleet renewing on, on next generation ships. Yeah, that's true. I think what we are seeing today on the supplier side, at least, is that many suppliers are starting to account for their own emissions um, internally in their organizations, and as part of that. They're also starting to look at what they call or what is scope three emissions. That means their supply chain emissions. So what we actually are helping uh, several also maritime manufacturers with right now is to map out their corporate emissions, but more importantly, map out the supply chain emissions of it could be a pump. It could be a life saving equipment that they sell to the ship owners, because once the ship owners then are ready to incorporate this data into their um, vessel uh, models, uh, they then have the, the data ready. So, so that is what we are we are working on right now. And we actually see several um, su- su- suppliers and manufacturers are really seeing this as a future competitive advances that they are investing in right now, which is uh, very exciting and and really. But I also think it's a lot of work for the manufacturers, and it will take time for them to get to know their emissions and i think the same will go with the ship owners is that once they are ready and once they start this process it will take time for them to to put a strategy in place once they get all the data so it is definitely something that will take time that's also from our side why we are encouraging ship owners and manufacturers to start this process rather earlier than later Um, not saying they should invest a lot of time and money in it but just starting 
getting familiarized himself with the uh, with the uh, tools and their own data. So down the line, they can set some strategies in place and some frameworks that they can work on. Are, are you seeing that we are um, move? I mean, you and I have been discussing circularity for the past five or ten years, something like that, Rasmus. But are you seeing that? Is this trend also a moving towards the shipyards? Are, are we are we beginning to see shipyards taking a larger stake in in, in this, these discussions, or, or or do we even begin to see them considering a closed loop circularity to, to the degree where they are where where they are taking full life cycle responsibility on 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 on, on their materials? I think we had a we had a very good talk in a previous episode with uh, Dewey from uh, Diamond Shipyards, and she is responsible for their new circularity programs. So it is um what 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 I could understand from the conversation with her is all about that they are actually actively investing and looking into circularity for the vessel designs, but also in the maintenance of the vessels. Um, on its if it's closed or open loop, I think it's uh, it's all about supply chains. Um, we do know that there is um, uh, supply chain issues uh, because of where we, what time we are in the world right now, um, and that will naturally put a premium on the uh, virgin materials. Um, so we are we are actually seeing some feedback that it might be more affordable to to use that, but we're also seeing some, how could you say, quality issues that we don't have frameworks in place from the classification society side on use of uh, non-virgin materials. So I also think we need to all work together to, to create that. But it's actually very interesting. I went uh, doing the SMM um, exhibition in Hamburg. Um, I actually was invited by the European Enterprise Network uh, to talk about circularity in the maritime because they were working on a recommendation for the European Commission on uh, frameworks for circularity and some of the ideas and some of the recommendations that that came up is all about what to define in the maritime industry when is um, when is material a waste when is it not a waste because there were some manufacturers that were looking into reclaiming fuel and using that but they were not allowed to use reclaimed fuel uh, because it was designated waste and so on. So there are a lot of legislative things that also needs to put and be in place. But what I could hear from the conversation in the network is that there are a lot of European projects popping up all over with a focus on maritime circularity. So it is definitely an exciting topic um, and, um, and, and also a good way of decarbonizing a vessel uh, because if you can, can create this closed loop, and you can even get up on the circularity ladder, meaning that you're getting away from the bare uh, recycling of raw materials. But if you can start using structures again, if you can start using uh, components again, you avoid the melting process that can be energy uh, demanding and so on. So it's all about starting thinking modular and start closing the loop on many of these loops um, in order to, to lower the emissions. Fantastic. That is super good news. I'm very thrilled to, to hear that. Thanks for sharing. Christopher, I've spoken to you a number of times over the years and you've touched on this circularity in speeches that I've seen you participate in all over the world. So no doubt you're kind of in touch with the global trends that are happening. So while here we're talking about the life cycle um, within the shipping industry or the circularity within the ship itself or the concept of the ship, how do you see circularity in society impacting the supply chain and therefore the trade that the ships are going to be in? That is a super good question. I think that what, what we, I mean, all of, all of us knows all the good stories about scrap steel and how scrap steel is being reused all over the world across, across a, lot, a lot of different uh, industries and sectors. I think what we are what we are learning is uh, that this can actually be applied to significant more commodities than, than steel, uh, but in some areas it requires that the that the that the virgin materials we are we are using initially need to be uh, designed for circularity, meaning that uh, the yield loss when we are reusing the material needs to be as minimum as possible. Uh, and in that case, 
we can begin to imagine that uh, more and more more and more uh, consumer needs can be fed by same same materials or again and again and this is this is clearly a super long term trend this is not something that will happen over the next 5 or 10 years but it is a trend that is likely to impact virgin material flows of, for example, iron ore uh, feeding steel production, but it could also be uh, a, a trend that is feeding large part of the minor bulk uh, commodities, but also containerized goods, because when parcel sizes are shrinking, suddenly we may, may begin to see that, uh, that we have more short, short sea shipping, uh, transporting these, uh, these materials both to to uh, to areas that can uh, that they can ready them to to secondary life, but also to reposition the, the materials to to be used in let's say a production of new cars or production of uh, entrepreneurial machines or what, whatever we have. So I think it's it is it is a big trend and it's a big trend that will basically decouple some parts of the shipping industry between GDP growth and growth and seaborne trade volumes. It will have a significant impact on parcel sizes, trading routes, ballasting times, um, but it is a long-term push. So it is it is difficult to judge the timing of it. But as Rasmus have already said, when we begin to see all players across across the uh, global supply chains, but also the maritime supply chains measuring scope one, two, and three missions, and begin to set specific targets on all three scopes. I think that, that the attractiveness of this circularity and thereby its impact on seaborne trade volumes for different commodity sizes uh, will supercharge and suddenly we will begin to see much more ticking up. But again, we need, we need a, a methodology from which we are, we are calculating, reporting and, and, and monitoring what we are doing what we can do, where products are available. And so basically, this is also a lot of, uh, largely a question about data, data availability, methodology, access to the relevant data at the right time, and thereby both from a legisl legislative perspective, but also, of course, from a consumer perspective, that we are willing and, uh, and capable of, of using used materials into our new buildings, whatever that is, whether it's a ship or a car or something else. And what we have seen from the car industry, for example, is that we have big car manufacturers, including players like BMW, BMW and the French car maker Renault. These guys have shown us that a, a large part of new cars can be produced from large parts of a new car can be do, can be produced from a circular from from previous used cars. So we are talking about a circularity yield of something like north of 90, 95 percent in new cars. So this is super high. And I think if we can accept it in cars, I think that there will be many, many other industries and sectors we can use it for. So it, uh, it is a trend that I see evolving over the years. How quickly it will it will mature and how quickly it will gain pace is super difficult to 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 guess about. But I think, as as I already mentioned, the more the more corporates and more people are getting interest in scope one, two, and three emissions, and, and the more strict targets we are seeing. Uh, companies and, and and players is making the the, the, the more the more uh, momentum these trends can gain. So so thank you for asking. That is super super important element, but on a more long term note than than uh, what we talked about earlier. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christopher Rex, for your input in regards to um, the whole life cycle thinking and putting some perspective on uh, the whole ship owner angle to it. And also showing us it is not as simple as it because there are market mechanisms, there is financing mechanisms that needs to align with also the whole fuel perspective for uh, creating um, the, the grounds for life cycle assessment in the future. But it's a very exciting to hear that there are focus on it already now and that you see in the future that life cycle assessment will play a role both to assess circularity, assess decarbonization, uh, but also to, to talk about what is a, a green ship. So thank you so much for participating uh, in our episode today, uh, Christopher. Um, but also thank you to everybody uh, here in regards to um, all of you listening to our mini-series uh, podcast. It's been great to have you listening over this episode of, uh, of the last six episodes. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep, and thank you very much.
Rasmus, especially for your guidance over these six episodes as I journeyed through the world of life cycle thinking and everything to do with that. And Christopher, thank you for your insights as ever and looking into the future and what we can expect to see in the industry. Don't forget, everybody, that you can sign up for the Fathom World newsletter where these topics and others get covered in detail. And remember to subscribe to the next Aranex podcast on your favorite podcast app. Until the next time, thank you and goodbye.